A very good morning to all of you gathered here for this eighth edition of Think Edu, which is uh, leaving inedible footprints on which the policies of education are getting built on. And this eighth edition, we are very fortunate to have the first session on the new education policy to be addressed by the person who was responsible for it in his capacity as the chairman of the draft committee that prepared this policy. And it's going to be released soon. And this version has seen the previous versions and is going to be an inspirational collation of all the versions of the previous policies that we have seen, beginning with the Radha Krishnan Commission, the Kothari Commission, which were the germinating seeds for the first NEP 1968, after which there was a major constitutional amendment, uh, post which education was moved into the concurrent list, and then we saw the 1986 NEP and the Plan of Action of 1992, after which another major constitutional amendment through the RTE, and then a various other changes that happened in the global education architecture. So this NEP is unique in the sense that it had to capture all of these progressive measures that has happened not only in the Indian education landscape, but beyond that. And when the draft committee prepared its report and was shared with the public, I also wrote a piece for the New Indian Express saying that it had all the policy nutrients of what I could see as a six-pack in the embryonic stage itself. So let's understand how, at the embryonic stage itself, that this NEP is a six-pack NEP from the author himself, as I invite, along with you, Dr. Kasturi Rangan, to give us a quick overview of the NEP. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him with a big round of applause. Thank you, Vidya. Uh, let me at the outset thank Sri Pabu Taulaji for this honor of inviting me for this very important event on the education. Having seen the previous items of this particular important event, I feel I'm really humbled and the type of speakers that you have invited, that the type of discussion that you had, the kind of support that you got from some of the very eminent personalities and the ones who spoke, all this. So it's indeed a great privilege. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Prabhu Savla and others for this unique honor. Vaidya has been known to me for some time now. We have worked together in some of the policies of the Government of India on the matters of education. A very knowledgeable person and erudite person so I am indeed privileged that he is chairing this important session on the question of how we have formulated the national education uh, policy. Uh, the first point that I would like to make about the national education policy is the genesis part of it, because I, I think there was quite a bit in the questions of genesis, with they are touched upon it in some form, uh, I was asked in June 2017 by the then Minister of Education, I mean, the Minister of Human Resource Development, uh, Mr. Javdekarji, uh, to see whether I could uh, revisit the earlier uh, plans, including the latest one, which was crafted by the TSR Subramaniam Committee, and uh, also the earlier ones, and one that was also made by the MHRD itself. And uh, the reason was that even though the committee, TSR committee, had gone quite into depth of the various aspects of the Indian education system, there were certain reservations with respect to uh, certain aspects that were touched upon by this committee's recommendations. And uh, also Javadekarji said that you can look at it in the totality, you can revisit everything that is there in this, uh, but most importantly, it should stand the test of time at least for the next 20 years and if possible by extending it for another 10 years by fine-tuning. So this is the broad framework that he told us that we should have in trying to do this. It was really very simple to say, but extremely difficult to think that 
in the modern times with the dynamic changes that occur in all facets of the human endeavor are we really in a position to say that we can have a 20 year policy which can stand the test of time but then that was said to be the moment this was announced uh, what was interesting is we had flood of requests from individuals organizations institutions and many others who wanted to come and provide their inputs uh, with respect to uh, this important uh, policy so that was one of the important thing that made us enthused on the fact that there was tremendous enthusiasm about formulating policy and looking forward to something that india should have as an education direction for the 21st century and of course there was the question of various aspect that we had to address it the committee came to the conclusion after looking at all the previous policies including the more recent ones that we need to visit many of the areas with a open mind and this really made us look into the various aspects of the policy right abinish i want to say this because initially javadekar ji told us to do it in 6 months but ultimately it took us 2 years to do this because the number of consultations we went through we nearly consulted something like 250 you very eminent educationists and academicians in this country we also had 60 to 65 organizations which participated in this and then of course there were many others who provided it in their personal capacity for a formal capacity so visual capacities and what not so it has been an exercise which was quite challenging very exercise which was very challenging and something uh, on the question of covering the entire gamut of the education that this country was expected to have as a policy for the coming two decades so what are the things i will just quickly go through in the next 10 minutes or so the important salient points of this educational policy the first is the schools what are the most important things that we have brought to bear and looked at it carefully first is the one which is related to the early childhood care and education covering the children between 3 to 8 years something which we realized has to be visited simply because of the fact there is a better understanding of the brain growth there is a better understanding of the neural sciences which affects the bone cognition and many other faculties of a youngster so this we had to do this so this is one of the key elements uh, which we have revisited and given a new direction ensuring foundational literacy and numeracy is the second point of which is a very serious issue this country is facing and this is the second point stepping the drop out is the third point the next extension of rte we are recommended that it should be now from 3 to 18 years to cover the entire gamut of the school education and the school education itself has to be restructured with an appropriate developmentally appropriate curriculum i said about the brain growth so that is the part of it that comes into the picture in terms of developmentally appropriate 5334 a something like the 15 years in school but then that is the totality of it but this particular educational system that we are talking of whether it is in the first in the foundational stage the preparatory stage the middle stage and the secondary stage these are the four with five years three years three years and four year architecture it proposes no distinction between curricular and extra curricular co curricular arts and science vocational and professional we knew that early part of school education school education itself should have something holisticity about the knowledge that the children have to acquire the new national curriculum framework has to be accordingly uh, re, 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 revisited or even redone central role of teachers is something which we we knew the central teachers are going to play the central role on this whole thing of school education we need to bring them into a recruitment process professional development we have addressed this in great detail school complexes is another thing once you try to talk of an integrated education a holistic education you need several areas several disciplines and you also have, don't have boundaries with regard to curricular extra curricular co curricular so we have suggested complexes simply because of the fact the existing institutions if you really look through in the country you can see most of them are working on a suboptimal basis so you need to have a support for teachers and provide shared resources and ultimately we have also brought in Uh, the questions of improved governance system the next one that i would like to say is this is just to give you a little bit of the scientific way why i am projecting this particular thing is only because of the fact that 
we have not just taken the facts and figures and then tried to craft a policy. We have gone into the scientific basis, the scientific aspects of analysis, wherever it is available. The committee has delved deep into that question and even consulted some of the best experts in this country, for example. This is a curve that was given to us by Dr. Vinita Kaur of the Ambedkar University. It clearly brings out one important aspect, that 86% of the brain growth occurs by the age of six. So if you really want to make sure that that growth phase of the brain of the child has to be tuned with respect to what you want to put into the knowledge base of the child, Obviously, you need to do quite a lot, whether it is related to language, whether it is related to mathematics, whether it is related to science. The beginning has to be made sufficiently early because once you get to the cross of something like 86% brain development, the further development and the further tuning of the brain to improve the knowledge and create the capabilities certainly is a much more bigger task. So that is what I want to say, and that is why when we say the developmentally appro appropriate education uh, in the school, in the foundational stage, it comes from this kind of an important input that we have taken into account uh, from the scientific researchers. The next point that I would like to say is, that brings me to the early child care and education, simply because this is the foundation of learning. Prior to age eight, as I said, the child learns best through play-based, activity-based, discovery-based, multi-level, flexible styles of educating and interaction. They do not follow the linear age-based educational trajectories. This is very central to the concept of bringing in the question of how do you create a flexibility in the education in this period and not to have a linear trajectory on the assumptions of which we try to teach the children, which they are not capable of picking up in many cases. Around this age, children begin to adopt naturally to the more prescriptive learning. This is around this age, a learning, indicating that teaching learning processes can transition to a more formal style, using basic textbooks, teachers, and so on. And this is the kind of school readiness that is critical to the child's success. A key reason for the policy to have three to age group as a single foundational stage, a major deviation from the existing school system. By grade five, the policy aims to achieve foundational literacy and numeracy. This is possible only because of the fact we have got this foundational aspect here. And then you are, we have also brought in some new concepts. How do we create the, uh, compensate for the inadequacies in the process of learning? The process of learning and the corresponding inadequacies are not because of the fact the child is uh, falling in love. It, the growth pattern of the child after the age eight is not same for all the children. So you need to correct that particular in, in, in unequal learning that happens in that trajectory. And that's why we have tried to see we can create new systems like creating national tutors, remedial instructional aids, social workers, counselors. So these are some of the things that we have specifically recommended, something which has not been a part of the school education so far. And this is critical to ensure that nearly 10, I want to say the seriousness of the problem, especially when it comes to the foundational uh, literacy and numeracy, nearly 10 crore of more students may fall out of the learning system in this country by 2025 if you don't address this important area. And of course, closely aligned, aligned to this is the question of language learning. The three languages that we have recommended, not for any other reason than the fact the children is able to pick up language capability in that particular period because the brain growth is there, the regions of the brain, which is on cognitive sciences, cognitive and neural aspects of it, uh, they are most appropriately tuned to grow, absorb, and also try to expand its capability in the process of trying to turn the language up to the age of eight. So we need to make sure that the language is given prominence in that particular context. Now on the higher education, what is important that we have tried to address is autonomy of the higher educational institutions. There are many things that one can discuss about it. Our whole idea is to provide a base, broad-based liberal education at the undergraduate stage, integrate professional education into the mainstream. This is an important thing because currently it's all segmented. Mainstream education, vocational education into schools, colleges in collaboration with industry and stakeholders and also provide flexible length for the undergraduate courses as well as the postgraduate programs. 
So and making enlightened use of technology. This I don't have to go into the details here, but we have done quite a detail of what areas currently the technology can play a critical role. And of course, there are the disruptive technologies that are coming through 4G, the question of artificial intelligence, there is another aspect of it. Then we are also making sure that there is a national research foundation which will pep up, which will just fortify the research program, particularly in the state level universities, 800 to 900 of them, I'll come to that once more. And National Education Commission is a structure that we have recommended and we think that we have to create an institutional memory and to ensure that the policy is responsive to feedback from the implementation, which could extend to 10 to 20 years. Then we go to the idea of why we have emphasized in the undergraduate, undergraduate education the liberal education component of it. The liberal education explores the remarkable relationship that exists among the sciences and humanities, mathematics and arts, medicine and physics, and more generally, the surprising unity of all fields of human endeavor. This is something which is very critical, which has never been seen in that perspective, but which has been a part of our ancient tradition, if you talk of 64 class and things of that kind. Liberal education helps the development of the creative and artistic side of the personality on the one side, and the analytical abilities on the other. The national policy recommends the introduction of liberal education at the high school level and at the undergraduate level. A comprehensive liberal education that develops all the capacities of human beings, intellectual, aesthetics, social, physical, emotional, and moral in an integrated manner. Now let us go to the, what is this liberal education that we are talking of in the undergraduate? We propose that the liberal education will be the foundational component of the, all the undergraduate education, which includes, that means, you take the knowledge in a holistic way, integrated way. The four-year undergraduate education will be introduced in order to create a space for student choice. The choices are the most important with respect to the undergraduate education. You can sail through science, arts, engineering, humanities, social sciences, and so on, and the provision has to be there simply. That is the concept in which the Liberal Education Foundation is built up. The four-year program will award a bachelor's degree in the, ultimately you will have an undergraduate degree based on a four-year program. Existing three-year degree program will continue. They will unbundle, the subject combinations can be unbundled. Both three and four-year programs can optionally lead to honors. Well, the whole idea is that student will be able to exit also, importantly, in the undergraduate, either in the first year with a certificate, second year with a diploma, third year with a degree, and if you do also research, in the fourth year you get an honor. So this is the broad thing. Integrate also the vocational subject as a part of the undergraduate education, the higher, the higher institution, education institution. Now I come to the most important aspect of it on the other side of the higher education, which is the National Research Foundation. I don't have to say much about the National Research Foundation's importance, because currently the university system, especially the state university system, are in pathetic condition so far as the research is concerned. We need to certainly inject a fresh dynamism into the question of research in the university system. <clears throat> research and innovation, of course, I don't have to say here, the knowledge creation is central to growing, sustaining large and vibrant economy. All I can say is European Union in the 2000, early, late 2000, their gross productivity increased almost, were accounted for and traceable to research and innovation almost up to 60%. 15% of the growth, growth pattern <coughs> were ascribable to research and innovation. America, the American Physical Society, in a single subject like physics and applied physics, <coughs> they created something like $1.3 trillion through the industry in terms of a wealth, which is almost 12% of the American productivity gains. So you can see the importance of the research and innovation in the context of economy. And currently, as you know, Prime Minister in the recent Science Congress mentioned about the fact that the science and technology has to contribute to the national GDP and to the 5 trillion economy. Certainly, this is the kind of a thing that we should now target. 
and you need to bring in this concept of a strong research base in this country. And so what we have recommended is a very high, highly empowered system with high finances, which will subject uh, the requirement management to fund research through a competitive peer review based subjects, building research in the academic institution, especially academic institution where we have to build the research, we have to seed the people, and we have also seed activity, and also bring in experts from outside to do this and help the mentorship, and this kind of it, again, creating beneficial linkages <coughs> between researchers, government, and industry, and we will do this in, at least to start with, in four subjects, that is science, technology, social sciences, arts, and humanities. I'm sorry. I conclude this with uh, the National Education Commission. The, we find that the educational system certainly has to have a new approach where the governance is concerned if the broad parameters and contours of what we have tried to project as a national education policy has to be, the, you know, something like uh, 19 departments see various facets of the education. Many times the linkages doesn't exist. There are too many overlaps with respect to the controls and other kinds of things. Uh, so we think that there has been an apex body, and the apex body ultimately will try to have an overarching responsibility. And in terms of how they will visualize the education, how you need to do mid-course corrections, how the policies has to be continuously reviewed with respect to how this kind of a edu educational system is progressing and corrected. So they become, in a sense, a custodian of the vision for education in India, which is the National Rashtriya Shiksha Ayog, we call it, or the National Education Commission. It will bring in experts from academics and educationists into the, uh, into the uh, administration and management of education over a long term and in a structured way. So that is, that is the most important thing. It contains both academics and education, nearly 50% of them. RSA will have an executive council, which will, do, which will be headed, of course, uh, by a uh, human uh, education minister or somebody at that particular level to ensure that education is evolving and the executive job of ensuring the major decisions taken at the RSA is implemented. And finally, it will have something like 20 to 30 members, which at least 50% will be eminent educationists, researchers, and professionals from various fields with a record of public contribution. It will also include, there is a political component to this, union ministers and a few chief ministers by rotation, so far as the other area is concerned. We think that the National Education Commission, a restructured way of governance, and most importantly, with the controls, from the highest level with regard to directions and policies and vision, I think is extremely critical at this juncture in this country. Rather than having fragmented directions, fragmented scope of work, as well as overlapping responsibilities and things of that kind. So we have tried to come out of this. This, in a sense, is a larger and a bigger scale of a governance system which we have now replicated, which we have done it, as for example, the Department of Space, which is a smaller department, which has got a similar structure where the Prime Minister is in overall charge. But here also we have recommended Prime Minister, but I'm not very sure. The Prime Minister will head this particular point, but most important thing is you need that apex body. That's what it is. On the whole, what we have tried to do is to bring in all the elements on which there has been past experiences, there have been deficiencies, they have been critically examined. The result is that we have a new policy, which is nearly, as people often quote in terms of the volume, 350, 360 pages. But more importantly, there are several elements on the policy touching the different facets of the education on which we have addressed the problems of the past. The most important, they are connected. So any attempt to take out small pieces here and there and try to implement it without looking at the totality and the connectivity between the different elements of the activity will not be a very wise thing to do. That's the third part of it, one would like to say that. The flexibility built into the system provides enough scope for people to get in and get out depending on their personal or other kind of reasons. And this is an important element, we think, in ensuring that the education is available for all at all ages and for all type of purposes which they will be doing. 
And obviously, when this kind of a policy comes in, there are very strong feelings of whether we can do it or not. Same question was asked to us 50 years back when we started space program. The question was, uh, can, do we need to undertake this? It's costly, risky, and what the use of, it, use of India? At that time, Sarah Bai said that it is not the question of whether we should undertake the space program or not. The question is, can we afford to ignore it? I think the same message com comes to us in education. Currently, it is no more the question of whether we should undertake a major transformation of the education activity. The question is, can we just go the routine way? Can we go through the regular way and then try to achieve things the world we are going to witness is going to achieve in the coming years? India cannot be left behind. I think the challenge is there. If the challenge is what makes it exciting. And this kind of a gathering, a gathering which has been called by Mr. Prabhu Chawla and his colleagues, is an extraordinary step in trying to propagate this kind of a challenges that the education can pose for the 21st century. I am sure with the kind of response and the kind of people that is here in this particular hall, I am sure the signature is, signal is good enough for us to be confident that we will move ahead in this particular policy uh, with all the thrust and direction and seriousness it needs. Finances have been questioned. I don't think, if you're talking of a five trillion economy in the next few years and talking of a 10 trillion economy, the third largest economy in the another 10 years, there is no reason why this education cannot be supported. And also we should make sure we have enough private support, philanthropic support, alumni support to pay up with what the governmental support would be. That is well within the capability of this country and its economy. I don't think we should worry about it. So I would like to once again thank Mr. Prabhu Chawla for this very unique privilege that he extended to me today morning to speak about the national education policy. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, sir, for the positive vibes you have created. Uh, we just have time for two quick questions since the Honorable Governor has uh, left the Raj Bhavan. The first thing is, remember when we were discussing about this in the committees, one thing that occupied our mind was globalization 4.0. And also in your opening comments, you said that this is a policy document that has to survive for the next 20 years or 30 years. And you know half time being a scientist yourself. So how are you going to address the longevity of this report, considering that globalization 4.0 is making last year's interventions irrelevant? So how are we going to bring a match between these two? We have addressed the globalization component as one of the key objectives in the policy. It is not that it has been, by the way, by considered. The, the thing comes from several ways. The one of the most important thing is that we have worked in this policy to ensure that most of the institutions have to set standards and outcomes, which are the world standards. And we have, you know, the three-tier system that we have recommended for the university system, the research universities, teaching and research universities, and standalone autonomous colleges with degree-giving capability. Between the three, they are configured and recommended with respect to world standards and world practices, which we don't, because there are not many examples except the best of the institutions in the world. And that we have taken into account. This is the first, is the first part of it. And we have addressed this not only with respect to the role of state governments, leaders of the institutions, faculty, students, and uh, areas, even regulators. So we have addressed it at different levels, this aspect of it. We think that the, the extreme fragmentation of the education system currently, 40,000 colleges and 900 in, in universities and thousands of other types of para-educational edu institutions together, I think is becoming a very inefficient way without no proper direction with regard to the dynamic nature of this. That is one of the reasons we have trans transferred many of these areas into higher education institutions, get the best of the expertise of the higher educational institutions into this vocational education, professional education, and also mainstream education. So we think that this kind of restructuring into three levels and bringing in education and all many other areas of professional importance, as well as vocational education into the higher education institution, and also starting some part of it at the school level, I think will bring our standards capability and sustainability and its relevance. I think, and particularly in the relevance, I would also like to say the liberal education, which is a foundational component of undergraduate education, really opens up a certain new capability for an undergraduate.
to look at a problem in its essence and try to get into a solution, okay. not just because you learn physics or chemistry or mathematics. Okay. There is an overall faculty improvement in the ability of judgment of issues. So that is, that is another important thing. I think these factors all will ensure that, that is, our education is as good as the best, but it doesn't lose sight of the Indianness about correct. the education. That is certainly there. So thank you. I'm advised to close this session. We don't have time for question answers from the audience, but he has really carried forward the policy right from K to 12 up to the research level. And in the subsequent sessions, we're going to unbundle each of these elements as we're going to see the intricacies of each of those building blocks of the Indian education sector. So ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to Dr. Kasturi Rangan.